Okay. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, thanks for being punctual. Okay. Good morning, distinguished guests, scholars, researchers, and esteemed participants. I am Suhan Kim, a professor of finance at KAIST and also the host of this event. On behalf of KAIST, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to this distinguished lecture by Professor Robert Ingle, the recipient of Nobel Prize in Economics. I'd also like to express our gratitude to the sponsors and supporters, including Seoul Metropolitan Government and Financial Services and Commissions, who made this event possible. Their generous contributions and support are instrumental in promoting academic excellence and fostering a vibrant research community. Before we proceed further, let us take a moment to, wel to welcome our keynote speaker, Professor Robert Engel. Professor Guang Wu Park, the former Dean of Graduate School of Finance at KAIST, will extend a warm welcome to Professor Engel and provide some insights about his remarkable achievements. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kim. Good morning, SOFI members and scholars from Korea. It is with great honor and pleasure to welcome back Professor Engel to KAIST for a special lecture today. Professor Engel is a professor emeritus of finance at NYU Stone School of Business. He was awarded the 2003 Nobel Prize in Economics for his research on the concept of autoregressive conditional heteroskepticity. He developed this method for statistical modeling of time-bearing volatility and demonstrated that these techniques accurately capture the properties of many time series, particularly with the variables in the financial markets. Many PhDs in finance or economics couldn't finish their doctoral dissertation without adopting Professor Engel's tools, including myself. Indeed, his models are indispensable tools for scholars in this area. This year marks the 20th year anniversary for Professor Engels winning of the Nobel Prize. This award was given on his past achievements, but since then, Professor Engels has continued to work and contributed both in academia and in practice in the area of climate finance and digital finance with forward-looking insights. In that regard, Professor Engel co-founded the Society for Financial Econometrics in 2009, and in 2022, he replaced former Secretary of State John Kerry as Chairman of the Climate Finance Partners Advisory Board. Academicians around the world are now talking about ESG and Professor Engel has timely talk for us today. Let us now move forward and allow Professor Engel to begin his illuminating lecture on have capital markets forgotten about sustainability, portfolios, greenwashing, stress testing, and long-run risk. Let's give him a big hand. Well, good morning, and actually, I think I need to turn this one on, too. So now, is this, is this microphone? No. Okay, how about, ah, how about that? <laughs> Very good. So it's a great pleasure to be in here, and, and thank you very much, Professor Park and Professor Kim. It's been uh, for your warm introductions. It's so nice to see so many of you here, and many people who I've known for a long time, uh, students, colleagues, co-authors, and uh, friends from, from Sophie, because Sophie, as you probably know, has been meeting uh, the, here in Seoul for the last uh, four days. So it's, it's 
it's been a, a great opportunity for all of us to spend some time here. So I want to talk about a, a topic which is uh, climate finance, and it's a topic about how capital markets are responding to uh, how capital markets are responding to the challenge of climate change, and uh, I'm going to do first of all some some sort of theoretical discussions, and then at the end we'll get to current events, and we'll talk about sort of what do we see today, and what are the what are the problems with uh, this kind of theoretical framework in terms of. Uh, what we see, and try to make sense of it all. So let's turn to the first slide. Um, so climate is changing. That's what science, scientific evidence is pretty clear on that. The economics is pretty confused on exactly what that means for us. Uh, economics is basically predicting we will have lower productivity, we'll have population migration, we'll have assets that are stranded because they no longer become, are productive in, in their current location, and these might be fossil fuel, but they might be other kinds of capital as well. There are predictions that economists make that we will have global conflicts and reductions in the quality of life, maybe more pandemics, and all sorts of really disastrous things, possibly the end of our species. Well, that's pretty bad. Um, but from an uh, empirical point of view, we've seen climate change all around us, but the future uh, realizations we think are going to be much worse than what we've seen so far. And so the most disastrous effects are in the distant future, and how do we build models about things like that, where we can't really measure them yet? And the answer is, of course, that when we think about the financial world, asset prices today are forward-looking. They have uh, estimations of what are going to be the winners and losers in the, in the future, and what, how serious is this really going to be? And we're going to use that kind of framework to talk about climate risk today, not just climate risk in 50 years. Uh, and a, sort of a, a, a trivial example is when you look at asset prices, uh, you see how important expectations are when you look at uh, Tesla, which, I don't know, a month or so ago was trading at 75 times its earnings, whereas General Motors, also a car company, also building electric cars, is trading for less than seven. So forecasts obviously matter. Next slide. So these, when we talk about risks, what we mean is something bad that might happen and it's in the future. And if this event, which is in the future, is far in the future, then we call it a long-run risk. And obviously, climate change is an example of long-run risk. These are events which might occur, and they are in the distant future. So even though the science may be pretty good at predicting how temperature global temperatures are going to change. It's not very good at telling us where that happens, where there are going to be droughts, where there are going to be too much rain, uh, how big the storms will be and where they will hit. And so the economic costs are quite uncertain. They're especially uncertain because, of course, we are all trying to figure out what to do about this, and public policy to mitigate climate change is certainly uncertain. It's very uncertain what, what we will be able to do to uh, slow this down. Next. So 
let me take just a simple example of this, which we will use at, toward the end of the talk. Suppose you're the owner of a beachfront luxury hotel. What are the long run risks? Well, one of the long run risks is going to be sea level rise. And this hotel can't be moved. When the sea level rises enough, it's going to be washed away. So this is a risk which is in the long run, you don't know exactly when it will happen, but you know that there is a termination period coming for this hotel. We call this a physical risk, and the hotel is likely to be an example of a stranded asset because it's going to be, uh, at some point, uh, the capital in this hotel will be worth nothing. Well, it might actually be floating out in the ocean, but it's, it's uh, worthless. So does that mean the hotel is worthless today? No, it doesn't mean that at all. And of course, that's the interesting question. What would you do as the owner of this hotel? You could, you could try to sell it, but assuming other people know that the sea level is rising, it's not going to sell for very much. Um, but you might remodel it. On the other hand, if you remodeled it with a long payback period, that would be foolish as well, because it's, you're really not going to get the benefit of the, of the payback. So one of the strategies that this owner would have would be to reduce investment, reduce costs. And as long as the tourists keep coming, then you have revenue and reduce costs. In fact, if all the other hotels in the same area do the same thing, we might see a reduction in the quantity of hotel rooms available, and therefore the shift of supply to the left, an inward shift of supply, which would lead to higher prices for rooms. And so this is going to be a sort of a short-term bonanza for the hotel owner. So. If you're an investor, would you invest in this hotel then? Well, you might, because this hotel is going to produce a lot of profits for a short amount of time. And those profits are what you would value when you consider an investment in this hotel. So the, the amount that the hotel should be worth would be something like the present discounted value of these increased cash flows up until the terminal date. And so the terminal date makes a whole lot of difference in terms of the value of the hotel, but so does demand. And we would think that the value of this hotel and the value of its equity would depend on two state variables. One is kind of how fast is the climate changing? When is this termination date likely to be? So that's, think of that as a capital T or something like that, the termination date. And the second thing is the demand for, for, for uh, vacation spots. So, so the reason I do this example is because I think it looks a lot like the energy sector, the fossil energy sector. That the fossil energy sector is likely to see that its business is going to end, or at least become a lot smaller than it is today. By the time we build enough renewable cap capacity, we change our behavior in whatever way, and even though there is not clear evidence that we're going to do this, you have to think that when climate change gets bad enough, will put policies in place to decarbonize our economy. And so every CEO must, of a fossil energy company, at least must consider this possibility. And this possibility is what we call transition risk, that we will put policies in place to transition from our high carbon economies to a low carbon economy. Um, so 
the same sort of argument says that if you're investing in the stock market, you ought to think about fossil energy companies kind of like this hotel, that it might depend on when the termination date is and what the demand for the product is. And those two state variables might tell you something about what the valuation of this, of this, uh, uh, of, of, you know, energy stocks would look like as a whole. So, um, no. let's talk about asset pricing now for stocks like this. It's clear, or at least it seems to me it's clear, that stock with faces a long-run risk is less desirable than one that doesn't face a long-run risk, and therefore ought to sell for a lower price, and it has to have a higher expected return in order to encourage you to take this risk. And so some investors will actually look for stocks that are exposed to long-run risk, and because they'll get a higher expected return, and other investors will say, no, I don't want to be invested in those companies. Actually, those are exactly the companies I want to stay away from. So what's the argument for staying away from them? Well, the argument is that an objective of an investor might be to develop a climate hedge. That is, to have a portfolio which will outperform the rest of the market in the event that the climate risk becomes greater and greater and the climate deteriorates more than the market is currently predicting. So if you want a climate hedge portfolio, you're probably going to underweight the stocks that are exposed to this climate risk and overweight stocks which are well prepared for climate change. This climate hedge portfolio would therefore smooth your consumption in the long run and you would expect to see uh, this as an attractive investment. It's a risk reducing investment for, for you if assuming the hedge works correctly. But we already established that this is going to have be underweighted or possibly negatively holding the climate risk stocks, and therefore it, this hedge portfolio is going to have a negative risk premium. That says you would expect everything else being equal that a hedge portfolio is under, under perform, will underperform the market. And it's a little bit like an insurance claim because with insurance, you know, you you pay something to reduce the risk. And here, again, you would pay something to reduce the risk. But it might not turn out badly in the sense that the performance might be good if, in fact, the climate is worse than the market currently thinks it is. Now, I don't know whether that's good news or bad news, but it's, it's, a, uh, it's part of the, the hedge idea. Okay. So how would we construct such hedge portfolios? Well, in fact, uh, we at the Volatility and Risk Institute have already uh, one paper in the uh, RFS which, which does this and uh, uses a strategy that we'll talk about in just a second here. Um, there are two general approaches to constructing a hedge portfolio. One says, let's use as much information as we have about the firms and try to figure out who the winners and losers are going to be from climate mitigation. The other says, let's take a look at what happens to statistically to stocks when there is news that the climate's getting worse. So that statistical question can sort stocks into ones that go up when there's climate news or ones that go down when there's climate news. So 
you would obviously want to be long the ones that are going up and short the ones that are going down, and that's what our RFS paper did. We actually regressed climate news against stocks to see which ones had positive coefficients and which ones had negative coefficients. In that paper, we used some ESG data. Uh, ESG data is, stands for uh, Environment, Social, and Governance, and is a common set of uh, data to use for this problem. It's widely criticized as being inadequate to the problem, but let me just say I cannot imagine any data set which would not be criticized for not being able to tell who the winners and losers are from climate change because it's such a complicated problem. So I, I'm, I'm in favor of more disclosure, better disclosure, compulsory disclosure, but I'm not optimistic that that's going to answer the question of how should you construct this hedge portfolio. So, Um, let me talk a little bit about two hedge portfolios that we'll use uh, in a couple things today. Uh, one is, is done based on characteristics of firms. It's called a stranded asset hedge portfolio. And it's a portfolio which is long. The S&P 500, it's actually an ETF on the S&P 500, SPY. It's short 70% of a coal ETF and short 30% of the broad-based energy ETF, XLE. So this, the characteristics of companies that are as important in this are just what industry they're in. That's the only thing. And so this is a, not a very uh, information-intensive measure. It's, it was generated, it was proposed by Bob Litterman at Kepos Capital, who uh, has used, says, has uh, developed investment strategies for the World Wildlife uh, Fund, and this is a good approximation to his investment strategy. A second portfolio that I think is, uh, that we've developed is called the Climate Efficient Factor Mimicking Portfolio, and this is documented in a paper which um, with uh, Jean-Luc Denard, Brian Kelly, and myself. And the strategy here is to develop uh, dynamic, long-only portfolios of public available climate funds. So what this is, this is a portfolio of funds. These are all designed to be climate hedges, but we know that some are gonna be better than others, and we wanna put together the best of them. And what we mean by best is a portfolio which has minimum variance and maximum correlation with um, the uh, news of climate change. So we're taking advantage of the idea that when there's news about climate change, that gives us information about which portfolios are likely to be good climate hedges. So. We're going to hold this portfolio. We're going to use a rolling sample of this, years worth of data, and then we're going to hold this portfolio for a month. And so we're going to look at returns, which are all out of sample for this portfolio. Next slide. Uh, so here's a, I mean, we're at a financial econometrics meeting, so here's it's probably my most technical slide, and it's really not very technical. But the idea is we want to form a portfolio, like in the left box, which is a weighted average of returns of these, these uh, funds. And in the green box are the equations, but the important one is the last one, which says we're going to model returns as a function of the news, climate change news, which is CC, and a series of other uh, controlling factors, which are standard risk factors. We're going to use three Fama French factors and uh, observable versions of the three, uh, sorry, tradable versions of the three Fama French factors, 
and uh, also the stranded asset portfolio. So this is a portfolio which is, in addition to the stranded asset portfolio, another aspect of climate change. And then the optimization problem is that we want to reduce the variance of this portfolio and maximize the correlation with the betas. Uh, but we only want to use funds which have positive betas in this regression, where the beta is the coefficient on the news. So we're asking, so for all the funds that seem to have a positive response to climate news, we want to form a portfolio which maximizes this response to the news, but has minimum variance. And so there's obviously a, a trade-off between minimum variance and maximum correlation, and the lambda here is a tuning parameter of this, of this problem. In fact, we've done this problem a couple other ways, which I, I think are interesting. We've tried not just using the beta, but, well, maybe we should square the beta or take the square root of it or something like that. We, that's all very reasonable. But we also might want to downweight betas that aren't very significant. So you get a large beta, but it has a low T statistic. It's not as useful and important as it if it has a big T statistic. So we actually have done this with beta times its T statistic, which uh, works in, in many ways uh, well. It's not quite as good at this in the test case we had, but I think it's an uh, interesting idea that, uh, that would, we should go f keep in, tr in mind as we go forward. So a difficulty which is not apparent here is when you're trying to look at the uh, variance of this portfolio, you need a variance-covariance matrix. And we're talking about, in this case, about 175 funds. We're following these funds on VLAB, uh, and, and uh, these funds are, are, have returns, daily returns, but when you use a year's worth of data, which has 252 observations in it, to match to measure a covariance matrix, which is 176 by 176, you get pretty terrible estimates just using the sample covariance matrix. So there's a long statistical literature on what you do about that. You do shrinkage, and you shrink this covariance matrix toward something which is positive definite to make sure that, that it gets uh, something, uh, a more accurate covariance matrix. And we're using a new version of that which our co-author uh, proposed, which is to shrink this, and this is in the journal Financial Econometrics, the, the journal of Sophie, uh, to shrink this covariance matrix to an equicorrelated matrix. That is, the diagonals are, are one for a correlation matrix, but the off diagonals can be all sorts of things. And an equicorrelated matrix says, let's set all the off diagonal elements to the same thing. And then you know exactly which values are still positive definite. So this uses the average of all these cross cor correlations and shrinks toward that so that they're not all equal, but they're moved toward equicorrelation. And that actually improves the performance very substantially. Um, we're using three investable versions of the Falmouth French factor, stranded asset portfolio, and actually the return on oil. So there are some tuning parameters here, and there's a measure of success. What do we mean by, okay, tuning parameters? Well, these are parameters that we're not getting out of the estimation. What we're going to do is we're going to do change these parameters a little bit and see whether our measure of success improves or not. This is a standard machine learning idea. And uh, so one is the relative weight on the minimum variance versus maximum signal. A second is the choice of the news series. Another one is the shrinkage parameter in the covariance matrix. And uh, 
uh, I guess a fourth one is what exactly the signal is that we're going to use here. Um, and what do we mean by success? Well, the success is measured by the out-of-sample correlation with the news conditional on the risk factors. And so, and so if you run the regression once you're done, of all these one-month periods put together against the same factors and the news, it should have a, a positive coefficient on and significant coefficient on the news, and it should also have a positive alpha because that's also a, a, a target. Um, so we now do this on VLAB. Uh, VLAB is the website of the Volatility and Risk Institute, and it's a free website. You can see it on your phone while, while we're sitting here if you, if you want to, although it, it's easier to see it on a computer, uh, and this is how you get there. One, if you don't remember the, the address, you can just Google VLAB, stands for Volatility Laboratory, and VLAB at Stern or VLAB NYU or VLAB Engel or any of those things will get you there with Google. So we do this uh, on VLAB and one of the things we see is what the portfolios look like. And so in January, for example, it had two funds in it. One is a Kensho Clean Power Fund and the other is a Carbon Impact Fund and the weights were about equal. Um, in December, it had three funds in it. It had a small amount of the Wisdom Tree Quality Dividend Growth, Growth Fund. So why is Wisdom Tree Quality Dividend Growth Fund a climate fund? Well, Morningstar says that what it holds actually has a pretty high E-score. And so it would be a reasonable thing to consider as a sustainable fund. So how do these benchmarks do? Well, our stranded asset portfolio over the last 24 years, which is as long as we've had it, has a return of 7%, volatility of 22%, and a sharp ratio of 0.3. So it has outperformed the market, not dramatically, but it, it has outperformed the market. The climate efficient factor mimicking portfolio has a return of 12% and volatility is a little bit higher and a sharp ratio which is a little bit higher. And uh, so that has also outperformed the market. So the answer I think that we want to give as to whether these funds actually have outperformed the market is, well, over this historical period, they have, but we don't know about going forward because this depends on whether the market has actually priced in climate adequately or not, and if the market has not yet priced climate in and we keep getting news that it's going to be worse, well, then they will continue to appreciate, but if not, then they will presumably underperform a little bit. Um, so if we look at more recent data uh, on these funds, you see in, um, in March of this year, the, uh, the stranded asset portfolio had a return of minus 25% over the, over the previous year. So that's pretty terrible. Climate efficient portfolio was minus 23%, that's also terrible. But both of those portfolios were really underperforming the market this, uh, this uh, of two months ago. Um, in, uh, in May, basically sort of one month ago, well, um, the uh, stranded asset portfolio has improved it's actually got a positive return, and the climate efficient factor mimicking portfolio is still uh, quite negative. That, however, should be taken as with a, 
uh, a caveat, which is due to a data vendor that's holding, that has canceled our, uh, our news contract for the, for the New York Times, this is not updating. So I think probably if once we get this fixed, it will, uh, the climate efficient portfolio will look better in this table too. And if you look at all the funds that we're, we're following, all these 175 funds, you see that on average, the average CAPM alpha is minus 0.68. Well, that's pretty close to zero, but it's slightly negative. That might be a reasonable outcome. And this is just yesterday or the day before. Um, and for different categories, you see most of the other specific categories, particularly the uh, low E-score category, they're all negative. The one that's doing well are these sustainable sector funds. So these are dedicated re, uh, renewable energy kinds of funds, clean energy funds and, and, uh, and wind and solar and stuff like that funds. Um, I should say that the average fund during the pandemic actually had about a 5% outperformance. The pandemic looked a whole lot like a decarbonization episode. Whereas a year later, that is 2022, it had the average fund of all of our funds had a minus 10% return, uh, uh, cap M alpha, that is excess return over the market. So that really is the change. And what we're seeing here is the consequence of that. Okay, so we've now spent some time on these climate factors. What do we do with them? Okay. Well, one thing we could do is invest in them directly. These are all investable factors. We could just invest them in our portfolio. Second thing we could do is be invest in portfolios that have a high beta on these funds. Third thing we could do is consider that kind of a regression as to be a test for greenwashing. In other words, you look at returns on some, some stock and you ask, does this stock have a positive or a negative beta on these, cap, on these uh, climate hedge portfolios? And if it has a positive beta, you say that's some evidence that it's actually green. If it has a negative beta, you say that's some evidence that it's not green. And so the significance. And you can do the, what we're actually going to have on the website at some time pretty soon is for more, for maybe for several different uh, hedge portfolios, more than these two, have such a regression, and then test the hypothesis that the, that say the, the uh, average beta is significantly greater than zero, and so we get a T statistic on the, the average beta across all these funds. And then the fourth thing is we could do stress tests of banks. The same way we're testing for greenwashing and the same way we're talking about uh, finding the portfolios that are good by looking at the climate beta on banks. And if you look at the climate beta on the banks, you're learning something about if the climate gets worse, what happens to the market value of this bank? And the reason that's interesting is because if banks have a, a lot of lending to the fossil energy sector, you might expect that uh, they would go down in value when the, when the, the uh, fossil energy sector become, goes down in value. And so um, central banks all over the world are trying to figure out how to do stress tests of climate effects from on their banks because you really don't want to have 
financial instability or a financial crisis to be a consequence of finally, after many years of trying, passing some sort of a climate mitigation bill like a climate tax or a climate subsidy and have that cause a financial crisis, that would be, that would be very, very bad. And it would actually probably make it even harder to pass this climate bill. So regulators don't want that to happen, and so they're trying to figure out how exposed are the banks to climate change. Um, so let me just show you a couple results here. So here is a table where the funds that we follow in VLAB are on the left. I, I've, yes, you found it already. Are on the left. They're uh, and the return and the volatility are in the center column. This is a five-year performance measure, sharp ratio. We have two news series, and this is the simple correlation between these two news series. And then there's the cap M alpha that we've talked about before. And finally, there are two more columns, and those two columns are the results of this greenwashing test where if you regress the return on this fund against the Fama French factors and the stranded asset and the CEP portfolio, what are the betas on the stranded asset and CEP portfolio? Because that tells you something about whether these funds move with the portfolio. Now this is actually sorted you can sort this by whatever you want. And this is currently sorted by the beta on the CEP portfolio. So we're seeing that the highest stock that correlates with the CEP portfolio is, the, is a solar energy fund. And then next to that is a lithium and battery tech fund. And below that is a China clean energy fund and so forth. So this is like two flavors of what we mean by green. One is it's a high beta on the CEP and the other is a high beta on the stranded asset portfolio. We've also done a very serious systematic examination of the climate betas in for the large systemic banks around the world. And uh, this essentially is a similar regression. We're going to regress the, let me see, we're going to regress the returns on each bank's stock against the market portfolio and against the stranded asset portfolio, which we're going to use here. And so these betas, if we did it by ordinary least squares, would be constant. In fact, we're going to estimate this using what we call dynamic conditional beta, which recognizes that the volatilities and correlations are changing over time, and so that what we use for each, each day of this regression is the current forecast of the variance-covariance matrix of the dependent variable with the two independent variables. So it's like doing a regression, but it's each day is a different X prime X matrix and a different X prime Y matrix. Those are changing over time. Um, so we get a time varying beta model. I must say the results look much smoother when we do rolling regressions, but um, have the same character. So we calculate uh, what we call C-risk, which is the expected capital shortfall of the bank under climate stress. And the capital shortfall is measured as the difference between total quasi-assets, which is the liabilities plus the market cap of the stock, multiplied by a constant, which is the basically the prudential capital ratio that we think banks need to hold, and we've set that to 8% here, but you can set it to whatever you want when you are on VLAB. And so that's the amount of capital that a 
we think a company should have, a bank should have in order to be uh, viable. Uh, the amount of capital it does have is is W, so we subtract these from each other, and we get an estimate of how much capital this bank would need in order to get up to an 8% capital ratio. So C risk says, okay, if we have climate stress, then the market cap is gonna be lower than it is today. And so in this new lower market cap, how much capital would be needed? It turns out that's a way of measuring how uh, the capital adequacy of the bank in the face of this climate stress. Um, another measure, which is somewhat different, is what we call marginal C risk, which is what's the difference between the capital shortfall today and the capital shortfall if we have climate stress? So that's the measure of exposure. It's measure exposure measured in dollars. So it's, it's a uh, uh, question of how, how serious this capital shortfall is. So let me show you what, some pictures from, uh, from VLAB. So here's Citibank. We all know Citibank. And this is the climate beta. This, I'm just looking at uh, five years of data. And what you see is that the climate see, first of all, that it jiggles around a lot. And then you see that it's, it's not really too far from zero up until July of 2019, and then it jumps up, and it goes up and up and up, and it's quite high during the pandemic, and it's subsequently come back down again. So this is kind of related to what we've already seen, that the pandemic was an era that looked like it was a, a climate stress era. And at that point, the Citibank beta seemed to be considerably higher than it is uh, today. So it's come back down today. What are the reasons for that? Well. One reason for that may be that Citi has changed its portfolio so that it's not as exposed to climate change. These banks know that the regulations are coming, that the regulators are going to do climate stress tests on them, and so there is some incentive to reduce their exposure. Um, but it may also be that just the market price of climate risk is not as high here. I don't know whether that's plausible or not. So how big are these numbers on the climate beta? Well, a way of measuring that is to look at the marginal C risk, where this is the beta is converted into dollars of market cap. And you can see that at the peak of, the, of this, it was about $40 billion the Citibank would lose if we had this kind of climate scenario. And if you look at the capital adequacy of Citibank, you see that in order to get to an 8% capital ratio, it would need maybe today $90 billion um, after a climate event. And it would need less than that, of course, if there wasn't a climate event. But, but some of this uh, capital adequacy is just because city is already undercapitalized, not because climate is such a big risk factor. Okay, so if you look at the list of the companies with the most exposure, that is the, with the most marginal sea risk in the United States, it looks like this. And here we have Berkshire Hathaway on the top of the list. Then J.P. Morgan, then United Health, which is an insurance, uh, a medical insurance. I don't know why exactly what the story behind that is, but and then Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Visa, Citigroup, American Express, and so forth. So this is the kind of result we have, and this gets updated every day. So you can follow these in a way which you can't possibly do with ordinary stress tests. Now, I don't know whether you'd be interested, but I've also done this for Korea.
I see. You're, you, you've all, you, you, you jumped my, uh, my, my uh, slide here. So here is a KB Financial Group, which is one of the large Korean bank holding companies. And this is the climate beta for uh, KB Financial Group. And it's the same factor. So the climate beta it could be compared with, with um, Bank of America. And so you see that there is a rise in uh, 21 and 22, as we saw before, but it hasn't gone back down again. I don't know whether the Korean regulator is very close to, uh, to doing a climate stress test, or maybe the banks aren't, aren't too worried about it, but at least this has not, this has not come back to zero. Um, here's the marginal C risk. So this tells you how many dollars are at risk from this kind of climate shock. And at the peak, it was about uh, $7 billion, and today it's less than three. So it has come down uh, substantially. And if you look at the capital adequacy, it looks like today, if we were to have a climate shock, uh, KB would need $28 billion to, of new capital to get himself back to an 8% capital ratio. Okay, so, and these charts are available for, um, I think, about 15 or 20 Korean banks. So you can go online and look at them. And if you look at the banks that have the biggest marginal C risk in Asia, not just Korea, but in, in Asia, you see actually the top of this list are the big Chinese banks, the ICBC, China Construction, Ping An uh, Insurance Group, Bank of China, China Life Insurance, Agricultural Bank of China, uh, China Merchants Bank, Postal Savings Bank, <laughs> and then Commonwealth Bank of Australia is, is number 10 there. So this is number 10 out of 488 uh, Asian banks. And so Korea does not contribute to the top of this list. The, the Chinese banks are, are much uh, more exposed to climate change according to this measure than, than the Korean banks. If you add it up for the whole world, you see the sea risk has been increasing and it's now something like $4 trillion that would be needed to recapitalize all the banks in the world after a climate shock. This chart is actually dominated by China, which has been increasing the, the capital adequacy needs of Chinese banks have been increasing rather steadily since uh, about 2007, I think. All right, so, um, okay, let me quickly turn to the current events. Um, this is a volatility map of the world, and what you see is that today, many countries have relatively low stock market volatilities. Uh, this is in spite of all the, what we think the bad things that are going on in the world around us, but uh, it's, it's what, what the numbers tell us. And this is the slide that I think we want to think about. Um, I don't know whether any of you are Star Wars fans, but this is the Emperor in the Star Wars trilogy that uh, at the end, as Luke Skywalker is having this fight with Darth Vader, uh, the Emperor smiles and says, everything is proceeding as I have foreseen. It's a very tumultuous moment <laughs> in this, in this uh, series. So the question is, is that true for capital markets? 
Everything is proceeding as we should have foreseen, but maybe didn't. Okay, well, so we've already pointed out that most of these sustainable funds are underperforming the market now, but this is not surprising because they are underweighting fossil energy, and fossil energy has been doing very well. Fossil energy was the, the best performer in 2022, the sector of the best performance. So the question, of course, is why has fossil energy done so well? Here we are trying to stop climate change, and the fossil energy sector is booming. Well, I think it's because we've asked the private sector to figure out how to decarbonize and investors and even energy, fossil energy companies recognize that it's coming no matter what the politics is doing, that they're going to have to terminate their, their, uh, their business or at least reduce its size tremendously. And so this example of, of the seaside resort is the same thing as what I think is going on here, that these fossil energy companies are reducing investment, they're not drilling for new oil at the same rate they used to, the number of oil rigs is down, uh, and they are, the reduced supply has led to higher prices and higher profits in places where there's no carbon tax. If there's a carbon tax, it might not have led to higher profits and higher stock prices. It would have led probably to lower profits and stock prices, but we don't have a carbon tax, so that's... So, what's the empirical evidence for this? Well, first of all, since stock prices reflect present discounted values of earnings, if you think the earnings aren't gonna last for very long, the price earnings ratio is relatively low because the long run forecasts are gonna have zeros in them or something like that. So you, we expect to see a low PE ratio even though the E is high. And um, similarly, stock prices reflect partly the book values, but book values are based on sort of historical estimates of the value of the assets of, of an energy company, including oil reserves and so forth, which may be stranded and never get, never get used. So we expect to see depressed prices to book as well for energy companies. So here's what you look at, what you see for 21 and 20, for uh, price earnings ratios. And if you look at the sectors across the bottom, if you can read those, energy is the far right. And energy as a whole actually had a negative uh, earnings in uh, 2020, positive in 2021, but the price to earnings ratio was uh, the lowest there. If you look at the price to book, you see the same thing, energy is the far right. Um, if you look at uh, data from March, which lists PEs in, the, in this column here, uh, you see they're so, I've sorted them by current PE, and energy, again, has the lowest, and it goes up from 6.44 to... Uh, to 29 for the technology sector. So it's a very big difference in the price earnings ratios, which is really reflective of the fact that, that the market doesn't think there is such a rosy future for this energy, these energy companies. If you look across the first row, one of the things in that first row is the um, the growth of earnings over the last five years. Well, they went up by 41% for the energy sector. That's a very dramatic increase. The prediction 
of how earnings per share will increase over the next five years by these analysts is 9%, much slower. So the, the, the market and the analysts all are behaving like they're investing in this beachfront property. Now suppose this is really true. What are the implications? Well, one thing we see is higher inflation than we've had in decades. And energy prices are really part of this. In fact, they may be a major part of it because we're, we're thinking that there are supply chain collapses and, and uh, long queues to get, to get uh, things from uh, shipped long distances. And partly that's because energy prices are high and that makes transportation expensive. And it's partly due to deteriorating relations between China and the rest of the world, which is leading us to trying to deglobalize as well as decarbonize our economy. So we're all raising our interest rates. Uh, ECB did it yesterday, the, the, or, or I guess it was Friday. Um, the U.S. was last week, uh, although the U.S. paused last week. Um, but what this is going to do is slow the glo global economy, hopefully solving inflation at the time, but it would be an awful lot better if we could increase energy supply and fix the supply chain. That would be a more attractive way of solving this inflation problem. But the, the big issue is really Russia, and we haven't talked about that yet. But when you, you can't talk about energy prices without talking about Russia. So what have we, what's the consequence of this Russian invasion of Ukraine? Well, we see a major reduction in energy supply, especially to Europe, from this invasion. It, it, and so it seems like Putin is acting just like these energy CEOs. He is, he is trying to protect his economy or country from the decline in his, his sector. And his solution is to invade a foreign country and hopefully that would, I mean, I'm sure he miscalculated how much it would cost. He probably thought it was going to be a, a walk in the park like, like, uh, like the Crimea was. But in any case, and this is not justifying in any way, but I um, would imagine that he believes that his energy reserves are worth more today than they will be in a decade. And so he's much more able to withstand this kind of a shock now than he would in the future. So if he's ever going to do it, it's got to be now. Well, I mean, that does not justify this catastrophic war, but it does uh, illuminate some of the incentives that I think he must feel. And you see incentives all over the Middle East to diversify their economies. They're either trying to sell some aspect, some part of their, their uh, energy empire, or, and, and use the reserves to build up other parts of their economy, a service sector, and, and uh, you know, and one of the, my, my secret idea is that, it's not exactly a secret, is it? Um, is that, is that, uh, you know, the, some of the Arab uh, countries will pave the desert with solar panels, make uh, green hydrogen from this, liquefy it, and sell it to all the world. They have more solar than anybody, and this would be a, a sort of a natural transition. I don't think it's economically viable yet, but it may be soon. So, does, is this all bad news for climate? Well, I'm not sure that it is. The, we've always known that uh, solving the 
from decarbonizing our economy is going to require higher energy prices because we need producers and consumers to make choices to, to consume lower carbon products. And so when the prices of energy go up like this, and people say, I can't afford my car, I can't afford to drive anymore, I'm gonna buy a Tesla. Well, I don't know if they exactly say that, but I buy a, an energy efficient car and I'll put a solar panel on my roof and it doesn't cost me anything anymore. They're doing exactly what, as economists, we want them to do. We want them to substitute low carbon products for high carbon products. And high energy prices is part of that. Um, so, and, and here we have all this inflation going on, and we can blame that on Putin rather than on some energy policy that we put in place which raised the cost of energy. I, I mean, I don't know whether blame is the, is the right word, but in any case, uh, so that's the next thing. Um, so the energy supply is being increased probably to meet the, the demand that, that is, uh, that's been reduced by Putin, but probably not so much because these energy companies still are recognizing that they would like to increase their supply temporarily, but not permanently. They're not doing new drilling. They're only uncapping old wells and, and uh, trying to be more efficient about where you ship the LNG and all that sort of thing. Um, so what would be different if we'd had a carbon tax? Well, if we'd had a carbon tax, then the high profits that the energy companies are now enjoying would probably not be so high. What it would be would be a lot of money flowing into the government uh, treasury that could be used to reduce some other tax or solve some of the climate justice problems and so forth. Um, we would, I think, have uh, this, we would still have high energy prices as a result of this because, in fact, the supply is being reduced, and it would probably be reduced even more if we had a carbon tax, and so the prices might even be higher. Um, but maybe this money that goes to the government would actually compensate people for the high costs and uh, by, for example, lowering income taxes or lowering you know, social payroll taxes or whatnot. So, these high energy prices, should they make us stop investing in sustainable funds? I'm almost done. Should they invest, have us stop investing in sustainable funds? Well, I don't think so because ultimately, this is a short run boom in energy prices. And it may be over. I mean, I, I sort of showed you that the sustainable funds are now actually doing almost as well as the rest of the market. So maybe this is kind of run its course. Secondly, even if energy companies are still outperforming, they probably should be considered as part of a hedge because if climate gets worse, the termination date is likely to get sooner and that makes the value of the stocks go down. And if climate looks like it's not so bad, that pushes the termination date into the future and the uh, energy stocks will go up in value. So um, it still looks like it's, it's, it, you should underweight energy stocks from a, from a hedge per portfolio point of view. So, I think that Putin has accelerated the decarbonization. I think we're going to find that, that at the 
end of this Ukraine experience that Europe will have a whole lot more renewable energy than they, than they did before or than they would have if it hadn't happened. I think the Biden bill, which invests in green renewables, uh, actually will lower the cost of energy in the future by, su by subsidizing green rather than taxing brown. And that is, I think, an interesting creative approach. Similarly, the European Union Green Deal is doing this, and I'm not really quite sure what Korea is doing, but it, it's, I think it's worth thinking about uh, subsidies for the renewable sector for clean energy rather than a tax or maybe in addition to a tax on emissions. So my feeling is that although sustainable funds look like they underperformed last year, the ultimate consequences are pretty good from a climate point of view. I don't know whether it's enough it's probably not enough, but I think it's, it's a step in the right direction. And so my three of my grandsons, looking at the future, have been pretty pessimistic. <laughs> but if we can tell them that we've got it solved, they'll be a lot happier. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I think I might have killed the time, huh? <laughs> um, do you, I mean, I can take some questions if, you, if you've got more time. Yes. We have a microphone, yes, there. Yeah, now it works. Thank you for your astonishing seminar. And my question is not much related with the climate change, but I want to ask you about the value of US dollar. And value of what? Value of the US dollar. <laughs> OK. <laughs> and after the Nixon shock, what do you think the real value of U.S. dollar comes from? And if you think it is decreasing by the quantifi quantitative easing, then how can we handle with it? <laughs> um, you know, that's, that's a, a good question. It's an interesting question, but I think it's going to take us a long way away from what I was talking about here. And um, actually, I did an interview for the, what, MK uh, paper the, the other day, and we talked about that. And, and I think when that comes out, you'll, you'll hear my opinion on it, which uh, is not a one-sentence answer. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thank you. Yes. Uh, so thank you for the great talk. Um, I wanted to ask you if you've been thinking, of course, I imagine you have done, uh, on the term structure of, of the climate um, uh, risk, because it looks like uh, what you measure in there, like it's the effect of something like a pandemic, like because it's short term with the betas and everything, but we would be interested in this tipping point where, you know, like uh, things are going to really deteriorate and I would imagine that this, this is going to be increasing, you know, like with the time to maturity. So I know that you can use options on, on the climate derivatives or you could think about a long run risk model, but I was thinking more on a practical perspective as a risk manager. Yes, I, I mean, that's a very good, very good point that here I'm saying that we, the, we have a, like a 50 year horizon, but I'm just using one, one observation on the climate risk. What I think is that the energy prices, the, the stock market price of energy, does have information on the long run, discounted long run behavior of the energy sector. And so what I want to know is, is there a risk today 
from changes in those long run prospects. So I'm actually taking the whole term structure and folding it in here. And one of the problems that central banks have is they don't want to use asset prices, which have this forward looking property, but they want to understand when various natural disasters are going to happen and therefore when do we expect to see shocks to, to companies. And I feel like we don't have to wait that long to see the shocks to companies because those are assets which we hold in our portfolios today. Um, but we could enrich the term structure. Uh, it's, but it's, I don't exactly know how to do that, but I, maybe options would, would do it, but long-term options are, are pretty, pretty noisy and illiquid anyway, so it's a, it's a problem. But thank you. Yes. Thank you so much for a fascinating talk. Um, you already mentioned, but I wanted to get back to the potential inequality because of this uh, energy policy, which I know is uh, more uncertain than anything else, but energy, you know, portion of income that we have to spend on energy is much larger for poor people. So if you ever have a policy which increases energy price, then uh, inequality will get worse. And we all know that now a lot of people believe that inequality has a negative consequences on growth, right? So and if you want to do anything and you have to have resources from the policy making stance, then we know that making any institution charging carbon tax is very, very difficult, right? So how would you think about you know, mobilizing resources to mitigate the negative consequence on inequality caused by potential energy? Thank you. This is a serious, obviously a very serious issue. Um, my, my proposal is that if we really had a carbon tax, that you would channel the resources there to lowering a regressive tax like a payroll tax, which therefore might uh, offset the, the burden on uh, low income uh, consumers who have, as, as you say, a much bigger uh, share of their expenditure on energy. But another answer to this question is really the subsidy versus tax. That the, by subsidizing uh, renewable energy, you actually lower the cost of energy for everyone, and that ends up making fossil energy even more uh, unaffordable. But the net consequences that consumers shift to using the renewable energy that's subsidized rather than the fossil energy, which of course is also subsidized, but not as much. Um, so I think that is a policy which has a broad appeal except from people who don't want to increase the deficit, which of course is a lot of people. But, but in any case, subsidizing renewables is, is more attractive from, a, from an income inequality point of view, I think. Oh. Uh. Okay, uh, let me ask you one more question. Uh, because uh, uh, anyway, I'm glad to hear your uh, nice talk and uh, particularly you have addressed uh, some climate issues. Uh, but my impression is you focus on relatively short term uh, climate risk reflected in your some asset management policy and other strategy. But uh, when I see the, the late uh, Dr. Uh, Weizmann, he has mentioned that ignorance of the fatal or some un unforeseen uh, event is not guaranteed ignoring the future risk. So because we know that, uh, because uh, I remember the uh, 
uh, Reynard has, uh, Brainard has mentioned the scenario analysis is necessary for stress test of the financial bank uh, robustness. And, uh, and then that means that in order to reflect such as fat tail problems in the long run, then we need some kind of scenario analysis to reflect all the, some very, Im the probability even though very low, but the consequence is really worst should be considered in your calculation of C risk or whatever it is. So my question is whether when you consider those uh, future, some devastating consequences, what would be some improvement to improve some your long run forecast. I definitely agree with your idea about that the energy price soaring and uh, relative better performance in recent years in energy sectors are just a temporary. And uh, as you mentioned, the Star Wars trilogy, the emperors, uh, the foreseeing is will be realized. I definitely agree with that, but then because it is unforeseen or is not it very difficult to measure it, we should not ignore it. And then according to the like uh, some uh, trembling hand, trembling hand e perfect equilibrium, we have to find any way to take into account of those consequences. What is your idea and opinion about that? Th that, that is a long question. Um, <laughs> Um, so, one question, one part of your question is, there are things that might happen in the distant future that are cata catastrophic. And Marty Weitzman was certainly focused on, on that possibility. We often call these tipping points where the uh, things get a little bit worse, a little bit worse, and then you get to some point, and then there's no going back. You can't, you can't solve it anymore. Um, and when you look at the history of the Earth over the millions of years it's been here, there have been times when CO2 was very high, and temperatures were very high, and there was no ice on the planet and sea level was 30 feet higher than it is today and we might go there. Um, so, but I think that your question is focused at what really is the social cost of carbon? You know, how much, what you do the cost benefit and now we're talking about taxing ourselves today to do this. Is it really justified to tax ourselves for some benefit which is far in the future? And what I've shown you today is not about what is the appropriate tax rate for this. It's a question of can we explain what we're seeing right now? The appropriate tax rate is much higher than I think than anything we're, we're doing and the, or the appropriate subsidy if you like because of these effects you're talking about and because of some sort of deep philosophical questions about what the discount rate really is for these long horizons where you're talking about the next generation, uh, the generation after that, the survival of species, diversity in, if, uh, of gene, gene pools and all this sort of thing. So, um, I think those are extremely important questions. They are dealing with things we know very little about and it's very hard to actually do this cost-benefit analysis in a reasonable sort of way. And so I think what uh, many people feel is we have to get started, but it might not be enough. And we're t this idea that the private sector can decarbonize by itself just by scaring the, uh, the energy companies to plan for, for retirement does not mean that that's enough to sol solve the climate problem. Uh, it's just a first step. And I, I think one of the important steps are the Paris Agreement where we uh, 
many of uh, most of the developed world uh, committed to net zero targets around 2050. And if in fact those commitments are, are satisfied, it would actually go a long way towards solving the, the climate change problem. But how do governments actually hit these targets is a whole different question. And that's partly where this, is, where this might be relevant. You know, if you put taxes on and so forth, how does that change the uh, allocations? Anyway, I think that's, that's a good big question. Maybe that's a good place to stop. So, thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor Engel, for sharing your insightful lecture with us today. Let's give our hands again to Professor Engel. Okay, in closing, I'd like to extend my sincere gratitude to each and every one of you for your presence at this event. Your participation has contributed in making this event a truly valuable and enriching academic experience. Thank you again for being a part of this memorable event. Thank you.